Today's video is brought to you by ZenThreadShop.com, the online store that makes a real difference. When you purchase from them, they donate a portion of their net proceeds to Beyond Giving, a 501c3 organization that currently provides funding to create and staff a nonprofit training center at which the underserved will acquire the entrepreneurial skills necessary to become self-sufficient. It's a great cause, and they've got some great stuff, so check them out today. Now on to the show. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there's always some sort of redeeming quality in most things, um, except the Macarena. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Room 6, the channel dedicated to the local Las Vegas music scene and the people that make it, including me. I'm Josh, and today I am very happy to welcome a true international recording artist. Um, number one on the Reverb Nation's world music charts. Congratulations on that. Thank you. And I uh, recently did a, a benefit with Daniel Alameda at the West Charleston Library for Beyond Giving, which is a nonprofit that gives back to the community. <clears throat> Not straight out of Senegal, but via a long trip. We have King Ibu. Say hi. Hello. Thanks Hello. for having me. So, welcome to the show, first of all. Thank you. And uh, how's your tea? Awesome. So far. Great tea. Thank you. No worries. <clears throat> it's not all It's not all, a whole alcohol in the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you... I, I know you've done many other interviews. I don't want to go over well-trodden ground too much. Mm -hmm. But for those of you, those people that have maybe have only ever seen you on stage but don't know a lot of your personal history... Mm -hmm. Uh, whatever you feel comfortable talking about, if you could say, you know, how did it start with uh, the Griots coming and, and playing for your family? How did that translate to, I want to do that? Uh, wow, great question. Never thought of it that way. Uh, I think the love and the passion for music was already there. And then seeing them play mm -hmm. almost kind of uh, made it real to me that I, I can do it. Yeah. Like study. I, I, get, I get that. Um, yeah. I kind of had the same feeling of you're always like singing and, and tapping at rhythms or whatever, and then somebody does something that speaks to you, and you're like, oh, that's how I could do it. Yep. That, that's how I can make, make this thing come out. Cool. Actually, um, yeah. So I know that um, through my you know research uh, preparing for this, that uh, there's a caste system in mm -hmm. Senegal. Is that all of Senegal? There's the same caste system, or does it change from area to area? Uh, relatively changes from one area to, to, to another, but basically it's almost the same. You have the nobles and you have the different castes underneath them. Right. Uh, unfortunately, it's still there, but not as, uh, how can I say that? Not as rigid. severe or rigid as it used to be, okay. you know, many, many, many years ago. But they still have that. They still, you know, based on the the family names, usually, right? Not always, but usually based on the family name, you can tell if such and such or such is casted or such is uh, comes from nobility, so on and so forth. Yeah. Right. And when we say nobility, it's not necessarily just king, queen, like that. Not right? not necessarily. Maybe. At, at a certain point, they were from royalty. Okay. Well, they're still from royalty, but they were closer maybe to the kingdom at some point. But it's mostly, uh, as they hate to say, that those were the people that were leading the society. And then some, right. um, you know, almost, I hate to, they were taking advantage of the, the less fortunate. It's a, uh, it's a cruel reality, unfortunately, that power, those in power aren't, you know, want to stay in power. Yeah. Not, so. Um, and you you were born into the noble caste. Yes. Which I, I understand that musicians were not really a big part of their caste. No, they should not play music. Right. Uh, it's mean, very much, we're it's us and them, and we're we're above you because we are the nobles, we're the leaders. The aristocrats and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. So what, did you get support for this decision to, to kind of break your caste, uh, break away from the caste from your, your family, or was it more of a... You're, you're, you, uh, was, were you an embarrassment? <laughs> uh, God, that's a good one, man. <laughs> so uh, I grew up with my mother. My, my dad passed away when I was less than one year old. So, And my mom is not from Senegal. 
Oh, my mom is from Mauritania. From where? Mauritania, which is north of Senegal, south of Morocco. Okay. Still on the west side. So completely different upbringing for her. Totally different. Even though, you know, Senegal and Mauritania have been neighbor, neighbors forever, right. have been one country at a certain time, I'm sure, uh, before the, the Europeans came. But anyway, uh, she was very supportive. And I was uh, a very good student. So as long as I could bring the, the A's... Hang on a second. That's all right. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> I like that one. Someone's at the door. <laughs> We're back. It was not for me. Oh, well. In the meantime, you were talking about your mother and how... Uh, Mar 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 Mauritania? Mauritania. I apologize for my American ignorance. I have actually never heard of that particular part of, uh, is, of Africa. It's still in Africa, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. North of Senegal. Was there also a caste system there? Oh, yeah. Even now, actually, they have a big problem right now with uh, what they call slavery. So uh, Indentured. Yeah. It's, it's very bad, actually, right now. Right oh. now, over there. So, but when she, the point I wanted to make was she was very supportive as long as I was a good student and I behaved. And... Uh, then, I'm now I'm getting old, I was pretty <laughs> gifted, so I was, if I'm not top of the class, maybe I'm second. Right on. And when, when I picked up the instrument to play, they were frowned and, of course, talks. But with her, that wasn't the point. Right. She was almost encouraging me, you know, as long as you... Because everybody like, knew you. Oh, yeah. As part of the Noble Cast. Absolutely. And they're like, small wait, place. wait, wait, what's he doing? Yeah, small place. I, I totally get it. It would be like, I don't know... A, Prince of Wales showing up at a barn dance and you'd just be like, well, well no, like you that. don't yeah. do this. Yeah. Um, was there the the usual learning? When you first performed in front of people, were you like ready to go, do you think? And looking back now, or was it like a, like a lot of musicians where you, you say, this is the best I am at the moment, and, and but I really want to do this? It's funny. I never looked at it in, in those terms then. Like, uh, am I good enough? Or am I ready to go? I was so, I guess, uh, just the, the passion, you know, I was driven by the love, you know, for that thing, like playing music, performing, singing and playing. And the first time, I, the show that I remember, it was when I was in um, at the university in college here. Mm -hmm. And I was part of the the band. So we had a band at the university and I played lead guitar for them and sang a little bit. Some of the shows at at op I'd be the opening act. So I'll right. play a few of my songs. I was just so uh overwhelmed by the the opportunity. Right. And you know, to share with people. People are listening to what I wrote, people are listening to my music to the point I was just enjoying the right. Was it also nice that nobody necessarily knew who you were other than oh that's See right here, you know, whatever. I mean, at the time, you know, just getting started, but we started, uh, we, we were very fortunate because at the time in Senegal, there was only one TV station. Ah. And that band was on TV, which was a huge thing. Well, I'm sorry, I, I missed, I, I thought you were saying that when you got out, when you got to here. No, no, this was in okay. Senegal, the university when I was in Senegal. Okay, so even, show, okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. All right, so sorry. Mm -hmm. um, it's all right. But, but, that's a nice segue to when you did leave. Mm -hmm. how, how old were you when you left Senegal? Uh, I was about mid twenties. Okay, so I mean, not, you know, it wasn't like a teenager, teenager or whatever. Yeah. Um, the information I came across said something about Norway and Peru. I've uh, I've traveled a bit. I've performed in uh, what maybe five cities in Norway. At some point played a few uh, European countries, Belgium done maybe something in france and spain wow i've been in ecuador and uh canada a few so uh, i've traveled a little bit thanks to the relationships i have with people that live overseas and the fact that world music to be honest it's still at its infancy here in america uh, after all these yeah. years we've been pushing to make it uh uh, you know, a genre that people know and can relate to. Uh, and that's, that's how come I, I got the opportunity to travel a little bit and work with those people. That's awesome. And I'm yeah. deeply jealous. <laughs> um, you know, it, I, 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 as a 47 year old man who's married and, and, you know, house, you know, wife, kid and, 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 you know, a real job and everything. 
I do look back when I was in my 20s and, and even 30s saying, you know, when I was single mm -hmm. and miserable because I was, you know, single, <laughs> didn't have a lot of money. But I, I, if I could talk to that younger me now, mm -hmm. I'd be like, dude, whatever it takes and travel and do, you know, do the things that you're thinking about for the future now because it's even harder <laughs> when you're older. Um, so I lost my train of thought. Oh, um, you speak English and French. Yep, Spanish. And Spanish, which Pular? I know Pular is in Wolof, yeah. How how fluent are you in Pular? I I can hold my own. Okay, I should, I should clarify. When I said I know Pular, I meant I know you speak Pular. <laughs> I didn't mean I know Pular. I was about to start talking. No, no, no. The, the the closest I've got is um I was in a, a vocal ensemble. There was a brief period of time where I was in college and I was a voice major. Thinking, okay, that's what I'm gonna get my degree in. Yeah, yeah. So um. And and we learned Nkosi uh, Sikelele, Africa. Oh, that's yeah, South Africa, right? Yeah, that's yeah. the national anthem, apparently. Okay. And I, I only remember Nkosi Sikelele, Africa, and that's it. That's awesome, man. <laughs> <'Cause>, you know, <laughs> then we moved on to the next song, <laughs> but we performed it. Okay. But um, what um, what was the response from European audiences at that time compared to like your first few gigs here? Oh, it was very different. So I bet <laughs> most Europeans that came to shows like that knew of African music or if right. you want world music. Yeah. Uh, but here, sometimes I mean, when I first started, there were places I like I performed in Mammoth Lakes, California. Okay. So uh, most people didn't know about it. There were a few people, you know, the, the people that I love, the hippies, I call them. Uh, cool people, the cool people. The so, cosmopolitan. Yes, yeah, right. They're open-minded, <laughs> so they've heard of uh, certain parts of Africa. They've heard of uh, certain, even like singers or performers from Africa. But in Europe, it was easier. It's like when I performed uh, in Senegal or when I performed in Senegal. Uh -huh. I'm speaking a language that the audience understands and right. knows, as opposed to here, I have to be almost the educator. Yeah, I was just going to say, you kind of have to explain yep. what what this is about to the audience, which can be, of course, a little frustrating. It's become, it becomes interesting, I think. It becomes very interesting because they get more involved. Mm -hmm. It's something that they don't know, and the people that show up usually have some interest. And then it becomes like a different uh, interaction, if I may, where people kind of learning the stuff and I'm learning at the same time how they perceive the music mm -hmm. and if you notice I, I always make that effort maybe we'll mention that uh, down the, later on down the road uh, I make a purposeful uh, effort for my audiences here in America to understand my music or at least to right. feel comfortable listening to it and I, I've been listening to your music the last few days uh, and Thank even you. when it's not in English I feel like I get the point um, and, uh, some of, some of your, uh, the rhythms, the polyrhythmic, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, the drums and things you're doing rhythms that as someone who's learning drums, someone who's done hand percussion, it's like, I've never heard these. It's, it's like, just when I think, okay, I'm getting it. There's a punctuation, there's an accent at a, I don't want to say weird time, but mm -hmm. for, for this, yeah. for my Western sensibilities, a weird time. Mm -hmm. And, and it's awesome because it keeps the, uh, the listener interested. Absolutely. If you got to pass like a minute, they're, mm -hmm. they're hooked. Yeah. Um, we, we both know somebody actually. Okay. Ramon Phillips. Yeah. Ramon. Ramon, Ramon Star. Yeah. Uh, I was surprised to see a video of him playing with you. Yep. Uh, more than one actually. Um, at the Bobab Theater? Yeah. Uh, no. At, oh, no, 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 not Bobab. I'm sorry. Um, uh, we played at the Winchester. We played... Uh, Winchester. Where else? I think we played at one of the other languages. There was one where yeah. he was playing... He, he was kind of uh, like like opening the song. Yeah, yeah, Winchester. With, yeah. Like, with his wah-wah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome, too. <laughs> For those of you that don't know Ramon Phillips, yeah. you're missing out. That's uh, and, and <laughs> he's he, a great he, guy. He, he does things with a, with a viola or violin that's yeah. amazing. Oh, he's an amazing guy. Um, and he, he can easily go from, from classical music, like like straight hardcore classical yep. music, to African top 40, music, yeah. to world beat. Yeah. Would you, world is music. world beat music... The same thing as world music, or is it? I mean, thing? I think it's all like it's all been packaged under one thing right. just to make it more. I know, like Rusted like, Root was kind of lumped, lumped under world beat music. All those things, man. But it's mostly the school I come from. It's world music, 
And the okay. reason why we call it world music, it's that um, that effort again I was mentioning earlier to make it consumable or easy to consume by any audience. Right. Because we come to your roots, we get some elements from your roots, we mix them with our roots so that it's easier for you to understand what we're doing or what we're saying. Definitely. And, and uh, with his music, one song can be, you, you, you'll be listening to it and then all of a sudden you'll hear a straight up guitar solo. Like, you know, a la Carlos Santana, which you have shared the stage with. Yeah, that's right. We'll get to that story. <laughs> okay. And then um, other times you'll hear um, more of a more of a reggae type thing. And I yeah. know you've shared the stage with the Whalers. Yep. Yep, which we'll get to. Um, but uh, with, with Ramon, mm -hmm. I noticed one thing that caught me off oh, guard, I forget where it was. Mm -hmm. He was doing a little while. He was inter introducing a song, sort of. And you walked out mm -hmm. playing a hand drum that you were beating with a, I forget the name of the stick. A, a mallet, basically. It's a okay. talking drum, the whole thing. A talking drum. A talking drum yeah. You walked out with a talking drum, and I was like, wait, he plays guitar. That's right. <laughs> I didn't know he did hand percussion, too. So um, yeah. I'm excited to see what he pulls together up in front of the guitar wall. Mm -hmm. um, It'll be fun. Now, before we get on to some of my more usual inter interview questions, mm -hmm. one last thing. Okay. Especially now, mm -hmm. okay, um, it's you know almost 2020 mm -hmm. you have all um, you've been doing for a while now the mixing of, of modern technology and, and old school music i know you've been recording your guitar and your vocals here mm -hmm. and then emailing it to so um what's his name to other people aziz aziz for example at, at, the, time, album, at, yeah, at yeah. the time of that interview yeah um uh but other people for the, the percussion mm -hmm. uh was that because you wanted that true senegalese rhythms that you, you or is that more of you just trying to include people i think it's the those two points uh, first i wanted to get the real thing from a very talented uh, percussionist like aziz who's an amazing percussionist and then i wanted to include the people that were in my circle that i worked with i used to gig a lot with him when i lived in la before i moved to uh Mammoth lakes and uh, you know, he's just, he gets it. We'll play just the two of us. He understands what I want to do. Right. And so it's easy to, 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 to work with guys like that. And the other guy that are on the other side of the world, but they send music to via, you know, email, I send him a truck, I send him a truck, just taking advantage of what we have, which is uh, no borders, but, uh, right. you know, it's become so easy. Like you can be here, I can be in Senegal, you know, if I come up with an idea, put a click to it, boom, I record it, send it to you, you can do whatever you want with it, yeah. And I've always been fascinated by that, uh, even even like a live, either a rehearsal or a live recording session where everybody's in a different country or a different state or whatever, yeah. Yeah. and you're looking at each other through your phone or whatever, um, it's... You have to be very comfortable with the music, I think. Yep. And you also all have to be on the same page, obviously. Absolutely. Um, now, mm -hmm. faithful viewers, now you'll recognize some of these questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, aside from all the traveling, okay. how long have you actually been in Vegas? Uh, I moved to Vegas. I moved here in 2003. So, since then, I've been a... Vegan, a resident of Las yes, Vegas. Yes, it's the term. Yeah, yeah. Vegan, so I know. I've been here since then. Yeah, right on. So yeah. you've been here just slightly less than I've been here. A lot of changes have happened, of course, oh, the last sixteen yeah. years, oh. um, almost seventeen years. Mm -hmm. How long? Um, how old were you when you first picked up the guitar? Like first said, "Okay, mom, I want to do this." Uh, I was around twelve. Okay, around twelve. Very funny story, and I'll never forget this. There were guys that lived in Podor, uh, that played guitar. Mm -hmm. There was actually one of them, I think it was a cousin of mine, who played on national TV. And he would come on holidays and uh, he would go to Podor and he would visit. And when I saw, used to see him play, I was so fascinated. I would just stick with him, make him a friend. Right. You know, I'll run errands for him just so that I can, maybe even if I don't get to touch the guitar, I can. <laughs> And I see and hear him play around 12. And of course, the funny thing that almost all of us have done, trying to find plywood here and then building your own guitar. And wow. Oh, okay. <laughs> so see, that's not something a lot of <laughs> Americans know about yeah. un unless they just grew up really 
really poor because yeah. I mean here it's just such an, an industry. I mean there was nobody selling guitars in Podor. I mean I now know, I'd yeah. be surprised if they're doing it, but maybe it's a different story. But at the time there was no store. There was, uh, there was a niche market. Yeah, oh, yeah. At the time <laughs> there was nobody, and when somebody came with a guitar, then the people I knew didn't live there, so they would come and spend a month or two months and right. and go back. But around twelve was really when I, uh, you know, got the fever. To be honest with you, a fever. Uh, we mentioned, uh, we talked about griots a little bit earlier. Was, is that sort of a, a gypsy term? What does that really mean? Griot, that relates more to almost like uh, troubadours, if you want to. And they were kind of, uh, they were very important. They're still very important to the society okay. if they, when they do their role. Uh, they were almost the, the, the history keepers. I was just going to ask about yeah. uh, storytellers. Storytellers, yeah. Just saying, here's our popular song. Absolutely. They were mostly storytellers. They would be uh, responsible for galvanizing warriors before they went to war. Oh, okay. Know, and telling people who this guy is. So it's almost like they did the PR then, and at the same time, they were the, the record keepers. They're very yeah. important to the, to the society, besides, you know, the entertaining aspect of it. Right. I never knew the term for them, but I... Mm -hmm. I've seen them in various things and, and heard of, I, I understand that that is a role that's very important, kind of not a town crier so much, but mm -hmm. as a uh, herald kind of. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and I never knew what the term was. So mm -hmm. now I know. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about, we kind of already talked about your early musical influences, mm -hmm. was, you know, real. Um, <laughs> what are you currently listening to that's, that's keeping that love of music alive? So my listening uh, material is very interesting. So uh, Let's bring it. <laughs> I would go from uh, heavy metal to jazz, classical music. I drive to classical music every day. So uh, see, you think you know? Yeah. Heavy metal it spans all sorts of genres and all yeah. sorts of people. So uh, of course, uh, uh, pop music. I don't care what my fellow musicians say. That is the, you know what I mean? I, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there's always some sort of redeeming quality in s most things, um, except the Macarena. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so good. it's good. To, but you, so basically, you're listening to world music. I listen to world music. Yeah. Right on. I listen to. World um, music. Now for one of those hated inter interview questions, and I mm -hmm. apologize in advance. And That's I, right. We kind of have already answered this. How do you define your musical style? And once again, I go back to what I call world music, right. and the way I define it is I use elements from uh, different cultures that I'm living in or dealing with, uh, and mix them with what I bring to the table so that it's uh, an easy communication. Uh, you know, I studied languages, that was my major, and one thing I pulled from it was communication mm -hmm. has one purpose, it's understanding. Right. So when I'm speaking a language that you don't understand, what's the point? Now, the one thing I focus on every day is I make the effort to get closer to you. Mm -hmm. I cannot control you. Right. I'm the one who wants to uh, communicate with you. So I make the effort to learn your style of music, your history, your language. And uh, by doing so, it allows me to be able to talk to you. Right. Even when you don't understand the language, I'm talking to you via my uh, instrument and orchestration arrangements, so on and so forth. And it comes through. It, it really does because, if, you know, regardless of where you come from, mm -hmm. if you listen to your music long enough, you'll catch something like, oh, hey, he dipped into that pot. You got it. Man. Yes. <laughs> and um, that's, a, that's a good lesson for a lot of you singer-songwriters out there. Don't be afraid to jump into the deep end of some other genre or, or language or, or style and flail and, and flounder around because it's going to round you out, make you a much more uh, aware person just in general for, for the world, which we really need right now. Absolutely. But also um, you'll be listening to something and say, oh, I recognize that. Yep. You know, that's a Javanese gamelan okay, yeah. or, or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, any musical goals right now for King Ibu? I mean, the goal has been basically the same. So I'm not in the business to be, you know, big name or popular or famous like some 
people, you know, <laughs> I respect them, it's their choice. Uh, the opportunity I've always looked for, I've always wanted is to be able to perform in front of people, to right. communicate, to share with people uh, this gift, because I call it a gift, never went to school for it, never took classes for it. I've worked hard on it. I keep working on it every day. Mm -hmm. So to me, I see it on that spiritual level. It's something that's been given to me or that, uh, and it's just a vehicle for me to, to be closer to people, talk to people and reach out to people. Nice. That's it. The goal is just to do more gigs. More gigs. And honestly, the more you need. Is that's it. And do more gigs. Yep. Cause uh, a gig is a gig and a pig is a pig. And if I ain't got no gig, I can't find a pig. Although, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> although, um, not everybody eats pig. So. <laughs> so, favorite show memory? Is there a mem one show or that really sticks out as, well, that was a wild, crazy night, or that was amazing, or that really tanked? <laughs> oh, man, I like that. I like I've that. heard some, do we've heard some doozies, like, you know, someone got so drunk that as they, they got done playing and walked home in their underwear, oh, wow. left everything. <laughs> wow, that's a new one for me. Yeah, me too. <laughs> So I was playing at this, uh, you know who you are on campus uh, in Senegal. And the guy I grew up with, my childhood friend, mm -hmm. while I was playing, I was actually in the middle of my solo. I was a, oh, <laughs> a lead okay. player then. <laughs> he started crying. Wow. And uh, the reason why I'm mentioning this, I was taught, a few days ago, I was talking to a friend of mine who lived in Sweden. I used to play with at the, uh, when I was at the university in Dakar. And he, he remembered that. He said, wow, I can't believe even then when you were playing, you were making people cry I mean, in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> <Thank God. laughs> and that just, that, when you asked me that question, that's what came to my memory. That was like the, oh, no, that's, I think the I most mean, intense yeah. moment. He's a guy I grew up with. I did everything with uh, Ali Asik, that's my yeah. brother, yeah. who is actually traditionally a griot. Wow. I don't see him as a griot. To me, he's but my brother. Still, someone who that make their living doing that. His family, I mean, he was he wasn't doing it at the time. Oh, okay. he's never done it. He's been a well, maybe an intellectual, he was and uh, he works. Most of my generation, most of them didn't go into that. Didn't go into what? Into being a griot oh. solely. No, they earned their living like everybody right. else. Well, this was the eighties. See, I mean, that was the eighties, nineties. Yeah, yeah. 90s, and yeah. and obviously, uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the old ways. Not so much got lost, but they realized, hey, we want things like cell phones and whatever. And oh, absolutely. We want, you know, cars or whatever. And we, we want money to do it. We can't do that as a griot. Oh, it's changed. It's changed uh, tremendously. It's not the same. I mean, what do we yeah. see in literature here? That's the one thing I'm so grateful for, to be here and tell people exactly what it is, rather than what you see on TV or what you read. Mm -hmm. It's not the same at all. When you watch a uh, national, what is it called? The TV station there. What they show you, that's not the Africa I grew up in, that Africa right. I know. No. That's the Africa that shocks. That's the Africa that brings attention so that they can get viewers and blah, blah, blah. Unfortunately, yeah. It's it's one of the reasons why I like doing Room 6 the way I do this it. It's awesome. I like this. Instead of, you know, a much more sensational, clickbaity type yeah. thing. Uh, much as I would love tons of subscribers, Right now, I can subscribe. <laughs> and much as I would love, you know, million views and all that stuff, I, I'm not doing this for that. Um, and it's not, you, it's not why I'm the way I do things. That's one of the reasons why I do all my editing. <laughs> I'm sure there are people I could pay that would make me look amazing, yeah. but I'm not making any money doing this. So yeah. it's like, why would I throw more money at it? On you know. But um, we're, we're, but I, but I digress. It's organic. So you know, it's that organic. is um, but that is an amazing show memory. Mm -hmm. I have had once where I made someone cry, but it was more of like they were in a bad spot, and I remind, I, I kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah I, 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 I unlocked the feelings of them. They were not crying happy tears, but absolutely, they were. Yeah. It wasn't like I was being mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, so from favorite show memory, mm -hmm. it's your favorite venue. Ooh. For whatever reason, I played uh, quite a few of them. Um, yeah. I like the house parties. You know, I could really see your your music in world music in general. Oh. Totally playing big at the house parties, or um, even like a block party where yeah. it's a bunch of people getting together. I do a lot of those. I do a lot of house parties. You can hire me anytime. You can. His contact uh, information will be down below, <laughs> maybe on the screen. Um, <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a different setting. It's uh, you naked. It's you. Uh, 
uh, you know, Depends raw. On the <laughs> it's you just human. Yeah. You know, you play in front of them and you're giving them exactly what you have without, you know, using the, the technology to camouflage certain things. So, right. and the joke I always tell is, it's me, mistakes and all, you know, yep. it's just a human guy, uh, a person communicating with you via his music and his stories. I love those. I love to do those. And it's always like an opportunity to connect with people on a different level. Mm -hmm. Because once you put your instrument down, you know, you start talking to people. It's not like a show you on a stage, you know, lighting, you know, how all that the show business stuff. Oh, yeah. So I love those are my favorite venues when people hire me to do house shows. And I, I like it because it's a different dynamic between there's the stage, maybe there's a curtain. Mm -hmm. Now here he comes, as opposed to you're hanging out, yep. talking, drinking, whatever. And, and oh, I got to go do a thing now. <laughs> now, now I'm going to perform. Mm -hmm. And when I'm done, we'll do more of what we were just doing. Absolutely. It's a totally different dynamic. It's like, oh, he's my buddy. Yep. He's my friend. Absolutely. Um, cool. Is there a dream show that you want to perform? <laughs> I like that. You talk about oh, yeah. just do more gigs, but is there one like I'd love to perform? on this tour or in this particular venue or whatever. Yeah, I would love to tour with uh, Stain. Yeah, That's he is one of those musicians dog. that everything he does, the second I hear, like I watch a video or whatever, I'm like, why am I not practicing? Why am I not learning a new instrument right now? He's, he's amazing. Um, yeah. And we've talked about on this channel before, Sting, Dolly Parton. Yeah, Dolly Parton. He's like nine instruments, oh, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah, it's like amazing. Really? Yeah, yeah, and and there are musicians that just they're constantly growing and learning just like you yeah, absolutely and they push it's not so much push people as mm -hmm. it is you're you're like hey uh why am i not trying to make myself a better musician yep. uh like so and so mm -hmm. but yeah sting also strikes me just as somebody who the ego, he, he got done with the ego a long time I ago. I think so. I think so, yeah. He's not at that level. And, you know, there are so many great musicians that I've had the opportunity to meet or work with. But honestly, the dream gig, uh, without knowing the guy personally, I've right, never right. met the guy, I've never met Sting. But uh, that would be really the dream gig to yeah. tour and, and, and or record or play with There's certainly with Sting. Be proud every show. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Mine has always been, uh, because I, I, I came more from music that was um i you know, studied, started on piano at seven years old mm -hmm. discovered guitar that went away <laughs> piano went away i mean yeah. but i was always more of writing almost country folk very much you okay. know like navel gazing singer songwriter yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but the american side of things and and then i came to the rock and roll mm -hmm. a little bit later in life i would love to do anything with Foo fighters oh wow okay because as band. people yeah. they're generally really nice mm -hmm. but also it's they also have kind of they've got, done the crazy bit they've taken the whiskey bottle to the stage okay. and now they're on the other side of just they're still putting out quality music yeah it's been you know over 20 years and um i i, I just get the feeling like it, it'll be a good time yeah and i'll have some good stories well, but absolutely. hey i'll, I'll take sting too <laughs> uh, I, mean, he's, I think he's an amazing dude mm -hmm. i think he's an amazing dude um and, and i think he managed to do, he managed to um, once he once he got over himself a little bit with the police and, and mm -hmm. leaving the police, he managed to somehow grow as a person and a musician on his own. Which Absolutely. it's not always the case. It's not easy. Not nope. easy. All right. So, do you have a next show coming up? Oh, we we are playing a public show on December the seventh. And when you say uh, we, uh, three. Uh, usually, every time I do a show, I'll have a guest. Right on. And uh, this is the thing. It's not a, a gimmick. It's uh, my essence as a musician. I've right. always done collaboration. Right. I, 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 I think, people. well, today, he, today you're going to be playing solo. So yep. we'll, we'll see yep. a strict raw. Yep. But I think it, it can only enhance everybody's enjoyment of it. Oh, absolutely. If yeah. you have other yeah. musicians, um, it's not a crutch that you're trying to hide behind. No, no, no. It's uh, mostly collaboration. And I've always believed in that, you know, the more differences you put together, mm -hmm. the more beautiful it gets. Definitely. That's my, my philosophy in life, yeah. Definitely. Um, we talked earlier about mm -hmm. Carlos Santana and the Whalers. Uh, didn't talk about uh, Pancho um, Sanchez. Sanchez, but how... Carlos Santana didn't happen in Vegas, right? It was, yeah, yeah, at the joint. Oh, it was. At the joint. Okay, so yeah. it was like, how did, how did that happen? 
in the hard rock. So uh, it's the full connections. You know, he he was doing his opening uh, show at the uh, when he had the residency at the Hard Rock, mm -hmm. the joint. I think they built that thing for him. I'm not quite oh, you, sure. You, you played his residency opening? Uh, yeah. Wow. That's show, yeah, that's show he played. And he needed an African element. He's always wanted to have African elements in his music. He's always had African elements mm -hmm. in his music, and he doesn't even hide that. Since so Woodstock, yeah. you know. And uh, uh, a gentleman that I knew then who was working for Lion King. And uh, he said, hey, Ibu, we have a gig and we need 10 percussionists, uh, African percussionists or Afro, because you had people that were sure. from other parts of the world. And uh, we need somebody kind of to oversee and do the whole thing. And uh, that's how it happened. And it's one of the most amazing experiences of my life. I, I bet. Amazing um, experiences. So, so I'm clear. These percussionists, you were basically the musical director for those percussionists? We can call it that way. Yeah. Yeah. For lack of a better term. Yeah. Somewhat. Right on. Yeah. Oh, so it wasn't you doing your original stuff no. with him. Oh, that's a shame. Because yeah. I, I would love it. I, oh. I would have thought you would have slid right in there. <laughs> maybe. I hear he yeah. lives in town. So maybe one of these oh, days. Oh, yeah. No, he's still here. We'll do a song or two together. Selling his fancy hats. Yeah. yeah. Um, but for the record, Carlos, I'm still a little upset about Napster. <laughs> Lars, mm. anyway, um, with Poncho, he's known for percussion. Yep. What was the, was that also a collaboration on on a percussion, or was that more you doing the guitar singing and he? No, I shared the stage with him. Meaning, I did a show while he was doing a show the same day, uh, but I didn't okay. work with him. Okay. Him, uh, exactly. No, I didn't work with right him. On. Like uh, Femi Kuti from Nigeria, we shared the same stage that night. Mm -hmm. The Whalers. We shared the same stage. We were playing a festival in uh, Milwaukee, I think, Summerfest. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was just my, it was just amazing. Oh, Mind yeah. you, I come from a family where nobody plays music. Right. I'm the, the only musician in my, in my family. In the, I think the lineage is the bad boy. It, you know, it's <laughs> like, that's, the, you know, that's almost like that. So yeah. me getting those opportunities, I just, I can stop mm -hmm. playing music today and I'll be the happiest guy. Right, you've yeah. checked off a lot of the old oh. rock star, or not rock star, but musician list. Um, I've been fortunate enough to, you know, have uh, the bass player, the most recent bass player for the Isley Brothers. Okay, oh wow, that's huge. Play at an open, he just was at an open mic, jumped on stage, said, hey, what are you doing? I was like, oh, uh, and I found out who he was, and I was like, I'm doing this, here's the key changes, yeah. let's go. And he played on one of my originals, Wow, which was amazing. That's and, awesome. and, you know, I... We could name we could both name drop for a while. Yeah. This town does give that to you if you keep putting yourself out there. You never know who's going to show up. You never know. You yeah, never you could know. be playing in some dive bar, and you know, oh, there's Sting. Wow. <laughs> Maybe yeah. I'll Although, stop doing that. I don't think I don't think Sting's <laughs> coming to Vegas anytime soon, just because he's again he's seen it all, he's done it all. Yeah. All right. Um, let's talk gear. Gear. Okay. Yeah. Every musician loves their gear. Yeah. What are you currently uh, playing? I'm the simplest guy ever when it comes to gear, I mean, uh, and that's been just a, a way of life. I like simple stuff right. uh, that doesn't, you know, excuse you know the quality of your instruments and so on and so forth. I've, uh, right now, I have this old discontinued uh, Yamaha, uh, and the story is very interesting. I was touring in Norway. Okay. And uh, the gentleman I was playing with, Bekai Hao, an amazing guitar player and singer that lives in Oslo, uh, he was using a Yamaha. I, I used to frown, I said, oh, these are cheap guitars. And, oh. uh, but that's one of the older ones. Okay. Like uh, built in the 80s or before the 80s, I'm not sure. And uh, Sorry to interrupt, this is the acoustic? Acoustic, okay. elect electric, yeah. So you, it, has a, it has a pickup sure. and a microphone. So there's, I haven't played, and I've tried a lot of guitars, you know, I've been to guitar shows where they have like the 10 grand and above guitars and so on and so forth. Yeah. But this guy, it's really, and uh, I looked for it for almost what, eight to 10 years, I couldn't find one, but they, they weren't making them. And all of a sudden I see one and uh, the gentleman who was selling it uh, lives in uh, England. <laughs> and he <stink>. said, I <laughs> smoke. He okay. said he's a smoker. I'm not a smoker. Right. I said, God, man, I've been looking for this guitar for so long, and I find one. Yeah. And guess what? It will smell like tobacco. 
I just close my eyes. Say, you know what? Ship it to me. Yeah. And that's the main, my main. Does, uh, does it smell? Did it smell like smoke? Oh, yeah, when you got of course. It? When you open, did you open the case? You're like, oh. oh, yeah. I got rid of the case, and of course, I got a new case for it, and had it fixed up. And the other one I've been using for a while is Golden. <laughs> Those guys should endorse me anyway. Yeah. Golden, it's a Canadian company. I've been playing the guitar forever. How do you spell Golden? G O D I N. G O D I N. Godin, if you want to call it. If for French. some reason one of you is watching this sponsor. Yeah, I mean, I'm just strong. <laughs> Sponsor me. Like that, you know? <laughs> but anyway, I, I love that instrument because it's very easy to travel with. And it's electric and it gives you like the acoustic feeling of it. They have okay. nylon strings on them. And oh, nice. it's easy. It's just like a workhorse. I love that guy. And I have another custom made by this, uh, these people. I won't name him because it wasn't a good experience. But I have this cool custom uh, guitar made. It looks like a Baroque body to it. Okay. I'll show it to you maybe in a picture Lots later. of fiddly bits or, or curly. Yeah, weird shape. Sure. Interesting guitar. But overall, you know, I'm uh, I'm very simple when it comes to, to instruments. Now, how about hand percussion? Here. Hand percussions. Right now, I have this cajon that was built by uh, the drummer who was to do the tour with uh, Michael Jackson. This is it, oh. the last tour. That's, uh, that's a weird little, like... I'm gonna start making drums mm -hmm. after that. That's that's yeah. a nice little segue. All yeah. right, cool. Eric he'll be Boseman. playing. He'll be playing like a home today. Yeah, I mean, let me play a bit for you. And Eric Bozeman, it was just a, it's not a, a traditional cajon. You don't. It's not. I was you play ask, on the head. Yeah, other was, than the sides. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, so you don't really sit on it while you play. You shouldn't if you want to okay. get the best out of it. Cool. I also yeah. noticed that um, it has a, it has a hole, but it's not a, just a straight hole all the way through. Uh, it, it, there was a like a baffle in the hole. Yep. Yeah. What does that do to the sound? Is it less? Is it? It gives me more boom, more bass. I was going to ask, is it less boom? But okay. It gives me more bass, actually. Yeah. I and of course, my favorite is the talking drum. A favorite, yes. favorite talking drum, which is a taboo instrument where I grew up. So certain people only should play that. Really? Yeah. It's kind of a little bit. Um, Those cask systems, man. I man, they, they <laughs> mess with it. It's kind of frowned upon because it's very vulgar, primarily. It, you know, the dances that would go with Ah, uh, there the we go. I was going to say, because the sound of it is it. not so much... Oh, it's uh, one of the best sounds out of, out of yeah. Africa, if you ask me. The, the talking drum is somehow it, the range of sounds that come out of this one thing. Yep. And part of it is where you strike it, right? Yeah, how you strike yeah. it, the pressure you put. The coolest thing is yeah. it's, it's very scientific. Mm -hmm. You have one force going this way. Right. And you have another one coming this way. Did you bring that today? No, I did not bring it today. Arr. We'll do it next time. That's all right. <laughs> oh, wait. Yeah. Um, but it's on YouTube. You can see it on uh, yes, most of can. my videos. And uh, you'll yeah. see Ramon playing there, too. That's right, yeah. Um, he also, uh, there's a video of him and you uh, doing your Africa song. Yep. Yep. And, and uh, he was singing it, too. And I'm like, yeah. how many things does this guy do? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, I are you familiar with someone named Gregory Michael Davis? Nope. All right. He's done. A, he's done a inter, We've done an interview and a performance on this channel, and he also has had Ramon and his stuff. Okay. And if you heard his music, it's not like yours at all. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow what Ramon does with him totally. Fits. Oh, he's an amazing dude. Yeah. So amazing anyway, dude. anyway, enough about that. So from current gear, is there any dream gear? Anything you still like? You want a particular thing? Nah. I you know I've always believed that my first instrument like I wanted to be go professional with bass. Oh, wow. That's what I, That's what I, I wanted to be a professional bass player. And even then, when I came here, I still have a bass with me. I have an old Fender with me. I still play bass. But once again, I am from that school. It's not the instrument. Right. It's what you do with the instrument. Mm -hmm. Definitely. You know, so it's what you bring. The instrument is just a vehicle. If you want to rely on an instrument to express yourself, uh, that's another style. So gear, I'm not a very... I get a nice beta Shure mic I take with me wherever I go. Right. I think audio or in microphone, that type of thing, that's where, if anything, spend a little money there. Yep. Just care about that because, yep. like you said, you know, the, in, the instrument itself, it is what it is, but how you, it, how you're, you're getting your, your uh, vocals across, getting yep. the sound amplified. If it sounds terrible, you're going to sound terrible. Yeah, I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. You don't need a. You need to be professional. Yeah. You need to invest in a decent guitar or decent two guitars. But you know, uh, that's I'm not a collector. You know, to me, they they the tools yeah. that I use, and uh, I don't want to be taking care of a guitar. And I I've never wanted 
that guitar that I was worried to take to a gig. If I can't no. play it at a bar and not worry about it, mm -hmm. you know, um, every guitar on the guitar wall you'll see is going to be like two hundred dollars or less. <laughs> it's, you know, and, and it's strictly because number one, I don't have the money. Sponsor me. And number two, uh, I, why? No, I mean, I mean, the, the, the decent guitars, I pay yeah. decent money for them, but. As long as the professional, they stay in tune, the wood is pretty sturdy. Well, humidifiers. Humidifiers. The humidifiers are like a must. You have to have a humidifier all the time. Yeah. And, but, you know, that's basically it. But I'm not a, a, gear, a gear guy. I'm not a yeah. gearhead. No. All right. Uh, so from, from Dream Gear, which is not a non, non thing for you, mm. ever lose gear? Yeah, of course, you know. Ah, you tell, us, tell us, tell us. When you travel, you lose gear, your gear is uh, destroyed, literally. And uh, it happened a few times in LA. It happened a few times when I traveled. Uh, I was going somewhere and I had to lay over in um, Atlanta. And uh, the, I, the mistake was I told them, don't check it in. If I have to travel, pay, so I'll let me carry right. it. They don't want to do that. I open it to check it before I go through customs. Of course, it's all the strings are where they're not supposed to be. And what you do, you go somewhere else and hope someone can yeah. get you a good guitar. You buy something else, you use it. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with someone in town named Guitar Doctor Bob? No. I've had people on here. I, uh, the next question I'm going to ask you is in, in uh, relation to maintenance tips. And, okay. And uh, I have had so many people just look right at the camera and say. Take your guitar to Guitar Dr. Bob. He also does other things too. Okay. But apparently, um, forty dollars for a setup and includes, oh, wow. includes That's awesome. uh, he'll uh even out any frets. Oh wow. Yeah, so uh, guitar Dr. Bob, I will be contacting you. Sponsor me. Anyway, um <laughs> but no, it, it's he he apparently uh does really good work kind of in the middle of Vegas. Okay. Um and uh may, he's like, been doing it for remember. a long time apparently. Uh, my my drummer, mm. who who teaches me drums, as well, has taken his guitars because he also has guitars. Okay. And uh, he apparently had a like a, a damage on the body from something. Okay. And Dr. Bob basically took every single piece and glued it back in oh, and wow. reinforced it, wow. and it looks almost That's awesome. Can't even tell. So yeah. Um, That's awesome. What is it? What is it? What is it, old thing? <laughs> Someone's, look, look at, at this Chloe. thing, look at Chloe. Hi. What is it? <laughs> huh? he's, not, he, he's not an axe murderer. Hi. hi. Say hi to the people's hello. Yes. All right, off you go. So last question, you made it. Oh, wow, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pretend we're talking to a new musician. Okay. Um, and, and basically, is there like one maintenance tip that you would give somebody, regardless of whether it's instrument or themselves or... or um, that's about it, really. We're going to skip the obvious things like change your strings, clean your strings, and, and, and you know, don't poke a hole in your drum. <laughs> yeah. um, what, what's one maintenance tip that you would give a new, new musician who wants to do what you do? A maintenance, I usually, and uh, most of my friends actually laugh at me. When I, do. I take it to the shop. Yep. I have heard both arguments. I take it to the shop and, uh, you know, they are the professionals and I want to have a professional sound, a professional instrument, so right. I take it to them. And, and that is really important. Um, have you ever tried doing your own setups or, or tried anything? No. Sometimes yeah. even when I have a decent gig, right. I go have and replace my strikes. Okay. I even pay for that. Why not? That's the guy who does it better. I don't want to be on stage and have issues because I don't put my, uh, you know, sure. let the guy do, do his thing. Right. You know. And, and it really boils down to what's important to you and how do you want to come across on stage. Yep. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, Thanks for having me. So thank you for watching. Hang out. We're going to get him up in front of the guitar wall and hear him do some music. <laughs> That's right. Thank you so much. Um, so thanks for watching. And uh, stick around. We're going to see King Ibu. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba. <laughs>
Maiene Africa. Baba yeh ida chibayo, na na yeh ida chibayo. Africa yeh niwa. Deju 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 bayo. King Ibu for coming by. It was a great interview and a great performance. If you want to see him live, you can see him December 7th at the West Sahara Library. Uh, information will be down in the description. If you'd like to see more videos like this, click here. If you'd like to subscribe, click here. Please remember to be amazing. And uh, thanks for watching. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. And uh, we'll see you next time on Room 6. Say bye. Bye bye.